Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm gonna show you uh, something that a couple of people asked me about in the last couple of live streams, which is, hey Dave, what plugins, do you still use plugins in the box? Even though you're mixing mostly analog here on the console and all this hardware, what plugins do you use, if any? And what do you kind of use them for? So the answer is yes, I do use some plugins. Uh, on my master, on my print track coming back in, I use stuff on individual tracks, some different types of tools, and, I, and I'm gonna show you that today. So um, before we get started, make sure you uh, you like, share, subscribe, go out to mixmusicanalog.com if you wanna know what I do over there, and be sure to check out the two hybrid mixing courses that we have. Links will be in the description box below. Um, so yeah, so let's jump uh, in and we'll take a look here in Studio One, I'll show you the plugins. Um, first, what we'll do is before we look at plugins, I'll just play back a, a little bit of this song here. This is uh, just about finished this mix. I just gotta do a little bit more automation, um, but the mix is pretty much done. Uh, so that's why I wanna show you now before I pull it off the console. Uh, so this song is by, uh, a wonderful country artist, Lori Cole. The name of the song is Bare Feet and Butterflies. We've used Lori's music on this channel before. We love Lori. Thank you so much, Lori, for allowing me to use this session as part of this YouTube demonstration. Make sure you check out her uh, socials. The links will be in the description box below. Uh, we're gonna do more of Lori's music on this channel in the very near future. So here's a little snippet of Bare Feet and Butterflies, and then I'll just take you through what plugins am I using inside of the box and where am I using them and why. So here we go. Here's some Bare Feet and Butterflies. Summertime and there's tiger lilies waking up on the side of the road. I've been chasing my tail way too long and it's time that I go home. I gotta water my roots and fill my boots with memories and good old friends. Going home is like a kind of therapy. The only place where I'm gonna find me. There we go, Lori Cole, Berry Feet, and Butterflies. Okay, let's um, let's bring up Studio One here for a second. Let's just take a look at some of the plugins. Where are they, and where? What do I kind of do here? So, let's start on the um, on the stuff that I'm typically putting on all the different tracks. Now, every song's a little different, obviously, but one plugin that I'm using a lot, of, I always use. Um, I'm using Auto Align to um, on all the uh, on all the tracks, you know, for phase alignment and all that stuff. But the verdict is still out for me as far as Auto Align Two versus Auto Align One. Auto Align Two is a lot simpler to use, and you put it across all your tracks, and it does all the voodoo under the hood. I'm not still quite sure if I love the way this one sounds compared to Auto Align One, but either way, I'm doing some kind of phase correction. Um, especially on drums and multiple mic'd up guitars and bass and stuff. So that's the first uh, plugin that I, I'm using all the time. Uh, the second thing that I'm using, uh, typically on kicks and snares, if you look up here, I'm using the Slate Digital, uh, the gate, their gate, the gate drums. Um, I'm using that on kick and snare where appropriate all the time. So I'm always using a, a gate. This is one of my favorite gates that I have. I know there's some other ones on the market that are really cool um, that I might try out at one point. They have uh, Black Salt Audio has Silence or Silencer is uh, a pretty inexpensive one that everybody's raving about. And I think the industry standard is probably Son Sonox uh, drum gate or gate drums or whatever that is. That's a pretty expensive plug and I'd like to try that at one point. But I gotta tell you, um, the Slate gate stuff works all the time for me on kick and snare. So I'm always using a gate on kick and snare most of the time. Um, and then typically on um, kick and snare, I'm always using samples of some kind and blending them in depending on the track and what it calls for and all that happy stuff. So I'm using industry standard uh, trigger two and I'm using pretty much the stock samples that come with it. I think I have the platinum version 
So I'm always using a kick sample and a snare sample and blending them in as, as needed, sometimes more or less, but this, it's rare that I don't use samples. I mean, once in a great while, but almost every single time on every single style of music. Um, so I'm using that kick snare and toms as well sometimes. So Trigger 2 is another plugin that I use a lot of. Um, and then uh, let's see, what else am I using? Okay, so on snare, typically um, what I've been doing more recently for my snare reverb um, is I'm using the Liquid Sonic 7th Heaven plugin, which I really like. And I'm using on this one, the fat plate setting. And I just use it as an insert and use the wet dry knob. Um, and then if I need to EQ it or something, I'll do that there. And then it comes out to the console. So typically when I'm using reverb on snare drums, more times than not, if I have a snare top and a snare bottom, and then my sample, um, I'm usually most times only putting it on the sample. So we're not dealing with any of the bleed getting into the um, the reverb, getting on any of the bleed, even though I'm using a gate, but sometimes the gate isn't hundred percent accurate, as I'm sure you know. So I will tend to put the sample or the reverb on the sample only. Sometimes that changes, but that's pretty typical. So I'm using uh, the Liquid Sonic 7 Heaven. If I'm not using that, I'm using, you know, one of the UAD lexicons. Sometimes I'll use the Slate Digital Verb Suites Classic, but recently I really uh, got into the Seventh Heaven because it's the Procrasti and it sounds really great. And I'm using that on snare. I'm also using reverb across most of the tracks analog here on the console with the Audioscape uh, XL305R. That just gives the whole mix a little bit of size, but any, but it's not enough to really hear it. It's more of a feeling thing where I really want to hear a little bit more of the reverb. I'll use something like Liquid Sonics. So that's the other plugins that I use quite often. Uh, on bass, uh, depending on um, the bass and how it's recorded, um, a lot of times, like on this session, I used R bass by Waves. Love R bass um, to really give me that nice thickness on the bottom. And again, I'm not using a whole lot of it, but I am using it. Um, so I'll use that. And then on this track, and I'll use awfully uh, an awful lot, I'm using uh, Sound Toys Devil Lock on the bass too, just to give it a little more grit. Sometimes I'll get a bass and a bass DI track, and I might grit up the bass amp track more and then let the DI be more of the clean thing. It really depends on the session and what I have. But a lot of times I'm using, if I'm using distortion on a bass, um, I'll use Devil Lock an awful lot. Sometimes I'll use Decapitator by Sound Toys, but Devil Lock is one that I'm using, you know, a good portion of the time. And I'm using it here on this particular session as well. Um, some other plugins that I will use from time to time, again, depending on the session, how large the session is. On this particular session, we had lots of electric guitar tracks that were in pairs. So I would group a lot of stuff in the box. Like here, I have several guitar tracks, four pairs of guitars that are pretty much playing all at the same time, a little bit different tone. And I have that going down to a bus and in, in, in the DAW. And then I just have it coming out to a pair of faders. So therefore, I'm not really using the EQ on the console. I'll be using some plugins in the box to shape those individual pairs. So in this particular example, I'm using the Slate Digital, the E-Series Dynamics, the SSL Dynamics. So any compression I'm using on those kind of distorted guitars, I'm using it here in the box. Sometimes I'm using this, sometimes I'm not. It depends on how much comping I'm doing in the box. Uh, so I did that on these particular pairs of guitars. I used the E-Series Dynamics on all of them, as opposed to breaking them out to all, a bunch of faders and managing all those extra faders. So that's, sometimes I'm doing that, sometimes I'm not. Depends on what it is. Uh, also on this track, I'm using uh, the Neve preamp. I'm using the Neve 1073 on the electric guitars on this particular one, just to give those particular electric guitars a little bit of a different flavor. Cause we had, I think eight or 12 guitar tracks in this particular session. So I'll be using some UAD preamps. Again, the UAD preamps and the SSL uh, stuff that I just mentioned with Slate isn't on every mix but these are plugins that I'll reach for from time to time. If I have to do some comping in the box, I'll lean very heavily on the slate in the UA stuff. Um, let's see, what else? What else is pretty common for me? Um, uh, one of the things that I'm using an awful lot of on lead vocals for reverbs and delays, um, I'm using the CLA Epic by Waves. I love this plugin. This is basically uh, four delays and four reverbs that could be mixed, matched, routed into each other or not 
all in one plugin, which is great. And it's emulations of Chris Lord Algae's uh, for hardware reverbs and delays that he uses. And I love this. I use this all the time on lead vocals because it's got so much flexibility and it sounds really good. Um, as opposed to using hardware stuff, I'm just using, doing it all with the plugin. And again, I'm doing it on an insert and I'm just using the wet dry knob to give it, you know, just, just as much as I, as I would like. So I use this all the time on lead vocal. It's, it's probably my go-to lead vocal reverb and delay these days. Again, along with the XL305, which is the hardware, but again, that's just a very small dose. Most of the heavy lifting with reverb and delay is being done here. Sometimes, if I don't want to use the delay in the Epic, I'll use Sound Toys Echo Boy. But most times I'm using the CLA because it just sounds good and it's so flexible. It's a great plugin. It looks a little overwhelming and it can be a little complicated. But honestly, CLA has created so many great presets in this thing. I just pick a preset and then I just lightly tweak it from there. And, you know, nine out of 10 times it works fine for me. So that's what I'm using for my lead vocal stuff. Um, and then, and again, that'll always pretty much always happen. So now on my print track, or what would be considered the master bus. So as I'm printing stuff in, I'm also using some plugins uh, on the master bus, which I'll do some sound examples of now. So my master bus chain is a mixture of hardware and plugins. So the first two things, and you'll probably see it come up on the screen because I think I am videoing it, I'm capturing the video, is um, as I record this video, my master bus chain is as follows. So we're coming out of the console, we're going into the Audio Game Labs Empress EQ, which you can see on the screen, hopefully, and um, it'll be tweaked from mix to mix, but my starting point, and I mix into this stuff, and all the plugins I'm gonna show you right now, I mix into. I don't put them on after the fact, I mix into them. Uh, but on the Empress, I'm usually doing about a 2 dB boost at about 12K, and I'm usually doing about a 2 dB boost at about 30 hertz um, is where I kind of start. And then depending on the mix, and how it all kind of falls out, I may adjust that a little bit, but that's a starting point. I'm always using the tube circuit uh, engaged on the Empress EQ as well. From there, it's going to my new Neve Master Bus Transformer, which again is, for this is only the second mix I've done uh, that, I've used that on, and I really like it. Prior to that, it was going to the Neve 542 Porticos to the SPL Big. Those for temporarily have been uh, unpatched, and I patched in the Neve um, there as well. So on the Neve, I'm primarily just using the Super Silk, a little bit of blue, a little bit of red, and I'm using, um, uh, I don't even think I'm using the compressor, am I? No, the Stereo Width. I'm using the Stereo Width. Um, I'm not, on this mix, using the compressor, I'm using, from the MBT, goes back into the console compressor, and I'm doing um, a 10 millisecond attack with an auto release, and we're doing about three dB of compression. That's pretty standard uh, for me. Um, sometimes, uh, as I'm experimenting, I'll not use that compressor, and I might use the one on the MBT. And then sometimes, um, as I was experimenting, I'll use both. I'll use a tiny bit of MBT and a tiny bit of the SSL. So it's just a matter of what I want to use. So I am using the Neve Master Bus Transformer uh, for now and for the foreseeable future. I really like the way it sounds but I'm kind of experimenting with it. And then from there, it comes back into the DAW, and now I'm using, on the DAW, I'm using some plugins here as well. So let's take a look here. So um, our first, maybe what we should do is I'll play back a little bit of this audio, and I'll go over to the um, Master Bus Transformer. I'll just bypass the whole thing on and off, and then I'll also do the same thing with the Empress EQ. I'll take the EQ in and out, and I'll take the tube circuit in and out, so you could kind of hear what that does. Make sense? Okay, let's let's do that, and then we'll listen to these plugins quick. So let me go back to the beginning of the track here, a little Lori Cole again. Again, make sure you go check out Lori. Links will be in the description box below. Uh, let's go over to the uh, Empress EQ, the Master Bus Transformer, um, and then I'll also bypass the compressor on the console before we talk about the plugins. Here we go. Summertime and there's tiger lilies waking up on the side of the road I've been chasing my tail way too long And it's time that I go home
Okay, so there's the MBT and the Empress EQ. So the first thing I turned off on the EQ was the actual tube saturation circuit. I always leave that in. And then I turned off the EQ. That EQ is wonderful. It's a Pultec style with a mid band. Right now there's no mids being boosted or cut on that. It's just low and top on this particular mix. Um, but it sounds just wonderful. It's just a wonderful sounding um, box. And then the Neve MBT. Again, using a little bit of the stereo width, using a little bit of the of the bottom, uh, the blue circuit, and a little bit of the red super circuit on the super silk. And then again, the SSL bus compressor, I'll just take that in and out just by just, you know, taking it in and out. You'll hear the difference. So right now it's in, and then I'll take it away. So it's just giving it that little squeeze that the SSL bus compressor does so well. From there, it comes back into the box and here's our plugins that we're using. So this plugin I use on every mix, it never not get, not get used. This is the Universal Audio Ambient Recovery or the Case Stereo uh, by Bob Katz. This is an old plugin, but I gotta tell you, it's like a secret sauce. Now they call it an ambient recovery. If it, 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 it's exactly what it kind of does. It kind of adds some space around stuff. It brings it back, but it also kind of acts or feels like a little bit of a stereo widening effect too, where it kind of lifts and pushes out stuff as well. And I have a preset called uh, Big Mix, and then I tweak it from there. This is a great plugin. Again, it's subtle, but it, it works wonderfully, and it just gives it that little extra stuff. So here it is. I'll turn it on and off, and you can hear it. Not to disappear. Listen to a bit of that radio station, the only one that comes in clear. We'll sing along to some old song, dance around the living room. And even though I know I'll have to leave again, doesn't matter because of where I am is down at the end of a dirt road. I never left because I never really let go. Still the carefree innocent girl. So it just gives it a little bit more space, a little bit more openness. Again, it's subtle, but I love it. I use it on every single mix. The other thing sometimes I will do is over here you have a mid side where, and sometimes in the choruses, I didn't do it on this song, but in the choruses sometimes I will automate and turn on uh, the, the side, I'll turn on the mid side gain and I'll just boost the sides maybe a little bit sometimes just to give it a little bit more pop in the chorus. I didn't do it on this mix, but I'll do that probably half of the time. Again, depends on the, on the song. So that's the, uh, universal audio, um, K stereo secret weapon from there. I'm going to another universal audio plugin. This is the Sonics Oxford inflator. Again, I'm using just a little bit of this. It's on its default setting and I just turn up the effect to a, between 20 and 25%. It just gives it a little bit of sizzle. I'm not even exactly sure what the hell's going on under the hood in this thing. I stole this from uh, from Joe Carroll, uh, who I really admire as a mixer. And he, uh, he was showing this in a video or one of his training courses at one time that he took. And I thought, oh, well, I'm gonna try that. I had the plugin, it's Universal Audio. And I really like what it does. Here's what it does. Listen, and you may hear a little, a little crack when I turn it on and off. It pops a little bit, but here, here it is. So again, it just it just gives it a little bit of a little bit of sizzle. I call it a little bit of this, a little bit of excitement. I like this a lot. So again, it's done in a very, very subtle way. And then from there, something that I'm starting to use more and more of now um, is the Universal Audio ART-102 or ATR, excuse me, ATR-102 uh, Ampex tape machine. Um, just lightly, just, just kind of putting a little bit of polish. This is a great plug and this thing just puts, it just makes everything sound better. Very, very subtle. Even if I'm using, and I know some people will ask, well, wait a minute, if you're using the Neve Master Bus Transformer or if you're using your Neve Portico 542s, which are tape emulators, why do you need this? Well, you, you don't. Um, but I would use this even with my Neve 542s in a very subtle way. Again, I, I don't, 
I don't rely on just one piece of gear or one plug in to do all the heavy lifting. I kind of try to just, you know, every little stage, I'm hitting it a little bit different. This is really nice. I love this. I love this tape machine. It's probably my favorite tape machine out of all the tape machine plugins out there. This one I really like. On this mix, I'm using the GP9 setting, or GP9 tape, which is a little bit more modern sounding, and I'm using 30 yips per second. Sometimes that will change, sometimes it's 15, and it's a different tape formula. Sometimes I'll mess with the bias setting a little bit and the EQ, but on this, it's just to give it a little polish and a little bit more oomph on the low end. So here we go, you can hear that. So it just gives it a little bit of a bump. It puts a little bit of polish. Again, I'm hitting this thing very, very lightly, very lightly in this particular mix. Sometimes I'll hit it a little harder, but again, it's just another way to just get some audio through it and just kind of polish it up a little bit. Um, and then from there, what I, I'll go to Ozone 10 here and, I'm, and I'll use this in different ways depending on the song. So one of the things that I really like about uh, Isotope Ozone Advanced uh, version 10 especially is where you have the free plug-in audio, audio lens where, you, where it matches up with this in the DAW and you can do some EQ matching, which I really like. And sometimes I'll do that as a way to, if I'm working with a reference track and I'm trying to match the tonality and I can't quite get there, I may, I may use tone matching to kind of push me in that direction or give me just another way to, to look at things and hear things. On this particular mix, I did do that. Um, and a lot of times I like to see what it does from an analytical point of view, especially on the EQ. And then what I'll do sometimes is I'll, I'll, I'll bypass, I'll see what they've added or subtracted on their EQ, and I may make those setting adjustments on the Empress EQ and then relearn it and flatten it out. But this one, I was so close, it just did a little bit of a bump here in the low end, and they took out a little bit in the, in the upper mids. Um, and then I'll use it also too for the maximizer. So when I'm sending a client uh, a mix, you know, they could hear it up at commercial volume even before it actually gets mastered. Um, and then sometimes I might use a little bit of the imager as well. Again, I'm using it on the MBT just a little bit, but I might, I might use this a little bit as well. Again, it depends on the track, but mostly what I'm using it for is for reference. Uh, and sometimes I'll just check things and turn this off and only use the limiter. And then sometimes I'll use the recommendations from the AI portion of this plugin. If I feel it sounds better, then I'll just use that. So it depends, but it's always in my template and it's, and I, and I'll, um, and I'll usually put this on at the end of the mix. I won't normally mix into this. And then my final plugin is my reference uh, plug-in, uh, my reference tool, which is the um, the uh, Plugin Alliance um, Metric AB, which is where I can go back and forth between the mix and a reference track, which is on every single mix. Um, and that's all the plugins on the um, on the print track coming back in. Um, the only other thing that I'm using throughout the mix, um, really more for automation, but also for some saturation, automation saturation, as I'm using the NG Levelers by Wes Audio. So I have two of these in the rack. Um, I think I did some videos on them. You can check the archive. And really, this is for, they're really for automation. All the automation is controlled by the plugin. Um, so you can do post-processing automation, um, which is great. Uh, and go watch those videos and I explain how it works and I demonstrate it and all of that. But what else I use this for, even if I'm not auto, because I'm not, I have the ability with two of these to automate all 32 long faders. And I don't, I'm not automating every single fader, but even if I'm not, automating a fader, if I hit the insert button on a console on a certain track, I could turn on the total harmonic distortion um, circuit to add a little bit more um, distortion or harmonic distortion to that particular track, even if I'm not doing any automation at all. So I have the ability to do that in every single track. So again, it's adding another layer of saturation in the mix if I want to use it. And there's three settings. There's, uh, well, there's two settings, medium and high or off. So for something like, um, let, let me give you like an acoustic guitar. I'll just demonstrate this quickly and just, just give you, a, let me just get, get to the acoustics here. So here's an acoustic. 
So there's our two acoustics. So that's on track 15, 16. So that's gonna be down here. So if I have the two insert buttons in and on the plug in here, channel 15 and 16, So again, even at its highest setting, it's subtle. And depending on the track, it may, you know, you may notice it more or less. But the fact that I have the ability to put that across all of the tracks if I want to, I don't normally, but tracks where I just want to add a little bit more of that saturation to it, the NG leveler is really great for that. And that's whether I'm using the automation on those particular tracks or not. So a lot of times I'll employ this on certain tracks, the lead vocal, sometimes the snare, even sometimes the bass guitar, depending if I want to crunch things up a little bit and just get a little bit more uh, a little bit more saturation on the track. It's like having 32 saturators all built into the plugin. And again, it's all 100% recallable and it's all post hardware processing, which is great. Um, so that's it. So those are the plugins that I use. Um, I use quite a bit. Every track's a little different, um, but I'm using all these plugins uh, in very mild doses normally to just try to enhance the track. And I'm always experimenting too, especially on the print track, you know, with things like the Sonic Inflator and now the Universal Audio um, Tape Machine. Um, you know, I'm always trying to pair them up with the hardware. The hardware pretty much stays the same. It's that n per CQ into the master bus transformer into the SSL compressor. And prior to the, um, prior to the Neve MBT, it was the uh, 542s into the SPL big all the time. And I still have those units and I'm still experimenting on whether or not which one of those two, uh, pieces are going to be on my master bus chain. I'll probably leave the Neve. And I don't think I'm gonna sell the 542s. I might patch those into a drum bus or something. I'm gonna probably keep those. The SPL big, that one might, might eventually go away because I like the stereo widener on the MBT better. And then I'm also using the, the K stereo by Universal Audio, which gives us a little bit more of a width effect. And then I also can use the ozone widener as well if I wanted to widen things even further. Um, but usually the MBT does a pretty good job. So. That's it, I figured I'd share that with you. A couple of you guys have asked me in some live streams about what plugins I use. That's what I use. Again, thank you, Lori Cole, for allowing me to use your uh, song, Bare Feet and Butterflies, in this video. Go check her out, links are in the description box below. Uh, and let me know in the comments if you, have, if you have any other questions about my workflow and stuff. I'll try to create these videos for you as they kind of, uh, as the requests kind of come up. So until the next video, I've been Dave with Mixing Music Analog and MixingMusicAnalog.com. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. I'll see you guys in the next video.